I'd like to thank the panel and Sages for the opportunity uh, and the invitation to present. These are my disclosures. They've been reviewed by the COI committee. So here's the outline of what we're gonna uh, cover. I wanna give you a, a little historical perspective because I think that's always uh, important when we look at techniques in surgery and the history uh, really, I think, needs to be considered. Um, things, uh, I think if you have that perspective, you really start seeing some of the unusual ways that uh, the field has evolved and not always for the best uh, reasons. We're gonna talk about safety and efficacy, length of stay and cost in particular, and also training and implementation. How do you make this actually uh, effective? So in the open surgical era, common bile duct exploration was really the gold standard treatment. This was a commonly performed uh, bread and butter case for general surgeons and trainees. And there's actually um, randomized control trials showing that it was equally safe and had superior stone clearance compared to ERCP. In this era, ERCP really only had a secondary role for patients that already had had cholecystectomy where they were considered too frail for an operation. So in came the laparoscopic era. And I think it's important to step back a little bit and realize just the degree of fragmentation of care that has occurred. Surgeons no longer uh, were uh, managing these patients uh, primarily, and the care started becoming very fragmented, different teams, sometimes the communication, as we know, is can break down, and patients uh, are kind of at the mercy of which uh, hospital they end up in, in, in large ways. So with this, we saw the rise of additional imaging. Uh, MRCP, multi-stage care uh, became the norm. And at the same time, we saw a decrease in IOC, poor adoption of lap common duct expiration by surgeons. And I think, granted, in the early lap era, lap coli was a, a difficult chief level case in most places, but we are way past that at this point. Our trainees now are growing up with advanced laparoscopy as our bread and butter cases when they're chief residents. We do a lot of flexible endoscopy and a lot of fluoroscopic guided interventions. So for the surgeon, what became of this fragmented care? Well, our, our role really, uh, if we weren't doing bile duct expiration, became one of navigating algorithm after algorithm after algorithm. And I don't know about you, but after a while, my head wants to explode when I see some of these algorithms. And so, as coined by my friend Ezra Teitelbaum, I think we are in a situation where a lot of us are being uh, faced with this. So what about bile duct exploration in the laparoscopic era? So I think it's important to understand the two different techniques, transcystic and transcolidocal. Transcystic, I think, is really uh, within the reach of most general surgeons who do cholecystectomy uh, frequently. So the nice thing about this is that you don't have to worry about a cholecystectomy. Um, and some of the limitations are that it does depend somewhat on appropriate cystic duct anatomy and small distal stones. Thankfully, these are the vast majority of patients that you encounter with this problem. So I think that most patients can be approached with that uh, technique. Transcolidocal, I think, is a different animal, and I think certainly there's a very special skill set that's required for that. Uh, but some of the benefits of that approach, if, if you do have the skill set, is that it's much more versatile in terms of the stone location, uh, but it should really only be done for large bile ducts. So my opponent presented some of the data, and I think that it's sometimes useful to summarize what we have covered. So stone clearance rates for both techniques, really equivalent or better even in some series. So I think bile duct exploration really is not inferior uh, and maybe even better here. So what about safety? So these are safety data on ERCP. Um, and I know they're from 2004, but these were data from expert endoscopists, high volume endoscopists doing ERCP. And you can see the morbidity is not insignificant. It's 15% overall. And the mortality is even up to 1%. So I think once you have a patient that has had post-ERCP pancreatitis that you've taken care of, and that patient 
even has a mortality, I think you really think twice and, and you don't take this procedure for granted. So it is actually equivalent to LCBD. I think there's a perception that because the RCP is quote unquote less invasive, it's safer. It's actually not. What about length of stay? So we've already established that efficacy and safety are equivalent. Well, as we all know, it does require more coordination to do ERCP. So oftentimes they want to be sure that the stone is there. So the patient gets sent for an MRCP and it may be Friday afternoon. It's not going to happen until Monday. And then you have to add them on to the endo schedule. So I think you're, you're really depending on other uh, teams, coordination, availability, resources. And we know that this does end up being longer length of stay and more expensive. And this was shown nicely in several studies um, by my colleagues. So what is the reality? Why aren't we doing this despite these data being more favorable? Well, I think it's a generational problem. This experience in biotic exploration has virtually disappeared. Most residents in 2005 even were doing less than one of these operations on average. So I think if you consider the historical perspective, as David Ratner put it, strange as it may seem, what once was a common operation for general surgeons now is considered a challenging and exotic case. I want to remind the audience that we're not talking about doing laparoscopic Whipple operations here. We're talking about utilizing techniques that we already use in other operations, advanced laparoscopy, flex endoscopy, and fluoroscopic guided things. So what are the barriers? I think some of these are real and some of these are perceived. So if you want to start doing this uh, for patients, and I really think that uh, as surgeons we have to increase the options that we can offer patients. So, okay, if you want to do ERCP, well, yeah, it's very limited, the opportunities for actually training in that. Most places of one-year fellowship, very few spots. What about bioelect exploration? As I said, I think that we have developed ways to train surgeons in this, and we've shown that you can, with simulation-based techniques and mastery learning methods, train residents and surgeons to do this. this also directly shows uh, increased clinical cases and improved outcomes for patients. And we've actually found that ability and confidence of the surgeon remains stable in one year. So I would say if we want to start doing this, clearly there's an advantage. I think what has to be acknowledged uh, and is important is that this be considered a new clinical program if it is something that you're going to do. But just like everything else, having the right equipment and training your team, I think, are going to be the keys to success. In summary, bioduct exploration, I think, is better for the patients and for society. It's as safe and effective as ERCP. I think it has shorter hospital stay and decreased costs. And I think it can be learned, at least transcystic exploration, by most general surgeons who do lap coli on a regular basis. I want to thank the panel and Sages again, and also Dr. Bercy, uh, who's really been an inspiration uh, for me during this journey.